The views and opinions expressed during Eye on the Triangle do not represent WKNC or NC State student media. Your dial is currently tuned to Eye on the Triangle on WKNC 88.1 FM HD1 Raleigh. Thanks for listening. This is your host, Abdullah Najjar, and uh, in, in today's conversation, I am joined by uh, Mr. Uh, Josh Paul. Uh, Mr. Paul uh, is a former director of uh, Congress- Congressional and Public Affairs for the Bureau of Political Military Affairs at the State Department. Uh, the Bureau oversees arms transfers to Israel and uh, other nations around the world. Recently, uh, Mr. Paul resigned in, in protest of uh, President Biden's push to increase arms sales to Israel. Uh, in 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 the letter in his resignation letter that went viral, uh, Mr. Paul expressed deep concern for the Israeli response and highlighted that it would lead to quote deeper suffering for both the Palestinians and Israelis, and that it is not for the long term American interests. Uh, without further ado, um, Mr. Paul, I'd like to welcome you to the studio. Thank you very much indeed for having me. Please call me Josh. All right. So, Josh, a lot has happened since uh, you resigned. There has been, um, you know, sadly an increase in, 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 in Palestinian death toll. Uh, now I think we're approaching 30,000, if, if not more. And uh, there's been a lot that's happening around the world. Protests, uh, there's been calls for ceasefire, and uh, many things happened since, you know, the October 7th. Um, my first question to you is, did you anticipate any of that, you know, the, the media coverage of your, you know, resignation, your appearances in different venues, your 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 talks uh, that you've given, and obviously the war dragging on for, for, for many, many months now. Did you by any chance anticipate any of that? So I certainly didn't anticipate the media coverage that I've received. Uh, but I did sadly anticipate the course of the war. I think it's been entirely predictable uh, in terms of its cost in Palestinian lives, the damage it has done uh, to U.S. national security interests in the region and around the world, uh, and its lack of uh, advancement, frankly, of Israeli security either. Uh, I think in all of those respects, it has followed a course that was you know, entirely predictable at the time that I left back in October. Mm-hmm. And now that it's, you know, you resigned, I believe, in, in October, if I'm not mistaken, this past October. And now we're in the, you know, we're in mid-March and we're seeing, um, you know, the administration, Biden administration, somehow changing its tone. Uh, I recall in in uh, in the past a couple of weeks where you know they're being presented with uh, the numbers of the death toll, Palestinian death toll. There's been some level of skepticism, uh, but now there seems to be somehow a shift. In a way, it seems like you know I don't know if I'm seeing that. But I don't know if it's just me that's seeing that, but it seems like there is some level of. Uh, I guess, a disconnect between the Biden administration and the campaign and the goals of the campaign that's being carried out by Netanyahu. What do you think of that? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't overstate that gap uh, or any shift in the Biden administration's policy. I think you're right, there has been a change in tone. Uh, and that's not entirely unimportant. But of course, at the same time, you know, as the Washington Post reported last week, uh, there have been over 100 foreign military sales moved to Israel since October 7th. Uh, as the Wall Street Journal reported, over 23,000 precision-guided munitions. And of course, in Gaza, we're talking about an area that is, you know, about the size of metropolitan Las Vegas, uh, mm-hmm. or the tri, uh, you know, tri-college area in North Carolina. Right. Uh, it, it's, not a, it's not a large amount of land for 23,000 precision-guided munitions. You know, I think the Biden administration, if anything, has gone out of its way uh, to avoid pressing Israel to really change the course of the conflict. And we see that in decisions to airdrop humanitarian assistance or to build an offshore pier. Uh, I think it should be striking, particularly to military families, that this administration is finding it easier to deploy the U.S. military into harm's way than it is to push an ally to follow its own legal responsibilities 
under international law uh, to provide humanitarian assistance to the population of a country or a, a zone that it is occupying. Um, so, yes, there have been changes in tone from the Biden administration, but there has not yet been a significant change in policy. Uh, the one area where there seems to be an emerging division is in terms of Israel's plans for an attack on Rafah. Rafah being a city in the south of Gaza where over a million people, 1.4 million people, are now huddled, many of them lacking shelter, uh, as they have been forcibly relocated from uh, their homes in the north of the Gaza Strip. Here, the Biden administration and President Biden have said that, you know, they do not believe um, an Israeli assault into Rafah is warranted at this time, should go ahead. Uh, but again, these have been words. And, you know, the talk is that if this happens, then there may be some consideration of restricting arms transfers. After Rafah happens, it will be too late. We'll be almost at the end of the Israeli operation. So that time for action is now, and that action is not happening. And, and when you speak about, say, a potential restriction of arms sales, how, you know, given that you were in the inside for quite some time, you're aware of these operations and how they work, how would you say, if a restriction were to occur, how would it manifest itself? Yeah, so there are certainly many options available to the administration. Under U.S. law, uh, as a matter of policy, the administration can suspend any arms transfer at any time for any reason. Uh, so there really is nothing holding them back, at least in terms of the policy options, from doing so. Uh, I think there are many options that are available. One would certainly be looking at the arms that are causing the most harm to civilians, such as 2,000-pound bombs uh, being dropped in urban areas with you know, a 50 to 100-meter blast radius, uh, and saying, no, uh, we will not transfer these types of arms. You are simply going to have to be uh, more discriminating in your strikes. Uh, you know, another thing that obviously hangs out here is the need to simply adhere to U.S. law. Uh, so it is U.S. law uh, that if a country is restricting the delivery of U.S.-funded humanitarian assistance, we may not provide them with foreign assistance, with military assistance. Um, it is clear because the administration has repeatedly said, including National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan, that the uh, government of Israel is restricting the flow of U.S.-funded humanitarian assistance. Uh, and yet we are not, you know, implying our own law, applying our own law. Uh, that provides a waiver, by the way. Uh, the president can say, yes, this is happening and still waive the restriction. But he has not even said, yes, this is happening uh, in a legal sense, despite uh, the obviousness. So I think, you know, there are, there are options in weapons flow. There are options in applying our own law mm -hmm. uh, and, and other options as well. Yeah. It's one of um, one of the key concerns that you raise in your resignation letter, Paul, is um, the idea that there was no there was a lack of debate when it comes to these these transfers when we're when it, when a transfer is happening and we're talking about say a nation that has um an x nation that has a, a record of say human rights violations typically there would be a discussion right there would be a conversation there would be a debate of whether or not uh the transfer say should occur and you mentioned that because there was this lack of debate when it came to to israel that was primarily one of the reasons why I decided to resign. I would be, I'm interested to know why is it that there has been, um, especially with this particular case, there is that lack, the, the atmosphere that sort of makes it uh, impractical or say, in, in a way, it makes it harder to voice your concern or, or to talk about this decision. But when it comes, say, to other nations, the the option of voicing your concern is available, and you can talk about the policy. So why is that? Why is there some, you know, there's a discrepancy here? Yeah, I mean, I think there is a discrepancy. It was certainly my experience in government, and I dealt with, you know, arms transfers to countries around the globe, many of whom are, are very, quote-unquote, difficult partners, right, with poor human rights records. Uh, one can think of the Philippines, Saudi Arabia, others. Um, there was always, you know, space for discussion both within the administration and certainly a lot of public debate uh, and debate with Congress. Uh, that has not been the case, particularly since October 7th when it comes to Israel. And, and you know, I do want to note that debate within government is vital to get to good policies. Mm -hmm. uh, when you don't have a good policy debate internally, you don't have a good policy outcome. You know, this is one of the fall, fall, uh, flaws and, and faults that autocracies often fall into, right? is where the leader says, this is the policy, and no one raises any concerns or questions, right. and then it turns out to be a bad policy. Um, 
that's not the way our system is supposed to work. And I think what was happening in the State Department at the time that I left, uh, which was this unwillingness to, to question the policy, is a microcosm of what we've seen more broadly in America uh, in terms of, you know, on college campuses, certainly. I, I have, you know, heard many stories of debate being shut down, of students being doxxed, uh, also of students being incentivized to dox, uh, dox other students uh, by being promised, you know, good career tracks. Um, we see this as well in the private sector. I've heard from you know thousands of people in law firms, in medical practices, in engineering firms, in the tech sector, uh, who are being told that if you speak up on this issue, uh, you will risk your livelihood. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we have a real problem here. And I think that at the end of the day, as much as we have a policy problem in the United States, we also have a political problem. Um, and that is one that we have to fix and, and address if we're going to be able to come to a better place that is more in the American national interest. Uh, whatever the outcome of that debate is, let's at least have the space to have it. Uh, because if we don't, uh, I think we are trapped. Yeah. Uh, speaking of aid, I think we touched on that a little bit earlier. Um, if, if, you know, uh, if, say, we would endorse the idea of, of, of trying giving humanitarian aid to, to, to the Gazans, how would you say would be the, the proper way? Because obviously these airdrops have led uh, to many, you know, unforeseen consequences. A lot of uh, uh, Palestinians died uh, as a result of, of these unanticipated airdrops. There were certain incidents. Um, but say we want to, to give, give aid to the cousins, what would you suggest would be a proper method of doing so? Right. So there are there are three routes here, right? Air, sea and land. Mm -hmm. We we are trying airdrops. Um, you know, it's it's weird because airdrops are something that you typically use either in a natural disaster when the roads have been washed away and there's no means to get, you know, food to isolated villages uh, or when there is an adversary blockading a city. Uh, you know, the Berlin airlift is certainly, you know, although not airdrops, one example. Another example is in uh, 1993 when the U.S. conducted airdrops to, you know, Srebrenica and Sarajevo, which were then being blockaded by Radovan Karadzic and Ratko Mladic, uh, Serbian war criminals who actually were convicted uh, in The Hague for war crimes, including relating to the siege of those cities. Mm -hmm. uh, I've never come across an instance in which the US conducts airdrops in order to get around an ally. Um, and, and the same right with the pier that we are now, you know, apparently building, which is going to take one to two months to build. So this is not a short term solution. Uh, of course, you know, the answer here, and, and which will, to be fair, allow significant flow of humanitarian assistance into Gaza. Um, but there are roads, there are checkpoints, there are trucks lined up outside of them right now waiting to get in. Um, you know, prior to October 7th, about 500 trucks a day of humanitarian assistance were getting into Gaza. Uh, that has dropped to fewer than 100 a day on average. And of course, the need has only grown because Gaza's economy, including its agriculture, uh, have been so devastated. So mm -hmm. the obvious answer here is to open those checkpoints. And I think we do risk falling into a trap, even in doing with the best of intentions, uh, when it comes to, for example, the building of a pier, because Israel has said that it does not intend to reopen uh, those ground checkpoints once this conflict is over. And what that will do is it will cut off Gaza from its main economic uh, partner, trading partner, which is actually Israel and the West Bank. Um, and so further isolate Gaza, make it dependent on foreign humanitarian assistance uh, and, you know, end or further destroy or damage, you know, prospects for a two state solution. Mm -hmm. Because how can you have that if Gaza cannot communicate with and cannot trade with the West Bank? Um, so, you know, there are there are a number of, of options here in the short term, but in the long term and, and really in the immediate term, too, for Israel to let through the humanitarian assistance that is waiting at the checkpoints uh, in Egypt and in Israel. Uh, is really the obvious solution here. Yeah. Do you anticipate any sort of change when it comes to the campaign that's being carried out by Israel? Because it seems like it's it's leading to more suffering, uh, as you've indicated, when you resign, and it's still leading to more suffering for you know both Palestinians and Israelis. We see the death toll of Palestinians is reaching thirty thousand, and a lot of um, injured Palestinians as well. And it's just, it's a serious humanitarian disaster. Is there, in your opinion, any uh, potential change to the campaign in the foreseeable future? Well, I mean, so not without the US using the leverage that we've just been talking about, whether in terms of arms transfers or, or it has diplomatic leverage, right? It can 
stop uh, vetoing ceasefire resolutions at the UN. It can uh, stop, you know, creating obstacles to accountability in terms of uh, international justice institutions. Uh, there are, you know, a number of, as we said, lever points of leverage the US can use. But if it doesn't use those, then I would anticipate, you know, the war will continue. I think Israel will conduct, as it has repeatedly promised to do, this operation it wants to conduct into Rafah, uh, which will certainly result in, you know, many thousands of more civilian casualties, uh, as well as the raising of much of Rafah to create a, quote-unquote, uh, safe zone uh, between Rafah, between Gaza and Egypt, that Israel can patrol, much as it has created a, a mile-wide uh, strip across the center of Gaza, uh, by bulldozing homes, universities, hospitals, um, and yeah, you know, so I think that's I think that's what we're currently looking at, probably in the mid-April time frame. And then once that's done, we'll see where we are. But I think you know we'll be uh, in a situation where Gaza remains, you know, in many ways unlivable. Uh, mm. Much of it, right? The idea, the notion that we're going to be able to rebuild Gaza, uh, which has been so decimated, three quarters of homes destroyed. Uh, electricity uh, facilities destroyed, water facilities destroyed, hospitals destroyed. The idea that we're going to be able to rebuild this uh, to the way Gaza was before the war, first of all, even in the best of circumstances, would take a decade. Uh, and of course, we're not talking about the best of circumstances. We're talking about a context in which, uh, as we know from past experience, Israel is going to block, uh, you know, construction materials from going in. Um, and, you know, as Arab countries have said, why should anyone finance the rebuilding or reconstruction of Gaza? without a guarantee, which Israel will never provide, uh, that this operation will not be repeated again in five years, in 10 years, whatever it might be. Uh, so I think we are looking at a lasting humanitarian crisis for the people of Gaza, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, so my final question to you, Paul, is um, say someone in your, in the State Department, uh, perhaps in, in, in the same bureau that you're working in, um, would decide to resign or they think that there's um that they feel like there's a policy that they're dissatisfied with or they feel like they're they think that something seems to be quote immoral that's happening and they want to voice their concern and they feel like a resignation is the proper course of action um what would you say to that person given that you've You've went through uh, something similar. Uh, I don't know if you had a backup plan after resignation or not, uh, but maybe there's something you would probably say now that you have uh, experienced, uh, I don't know, many uh, chances of, uh, you know, you've made, you've appeared in different media outlets, you've, you've talked about this, this issue, but maybe you didn't anticipate any of that. But now that you have experienced all of this, what would you say to someone that might go through a similar uh, decision? Yeah, no, it's, it's actually a conversation I've had many times over in the last few months with people thinking about leaving. Um, and you're right, I did actually have a backup plan. And my backup plan was, you know, I've worked on security sector reform projects in, in the West Bank, but also in Iraq. And my backup plan was, look, you know, I can always find some work overseas where I can continue to work in an interesting environment on things I I care about. Um, and I think that's important to have. You know, my first, the first thing I say to people who reach out to me and say, hey, I'm thinking about leaving, is, you know, what they say on the uh, on the airplanes as they're giving the safety demonstration, make sure your own mask is secured before you help those <laughs> around you. Um, yeah. And, you know, I think making sure that, you know, for example, in this country, you know, your health care comes with your job. So making sure you can cover yourself in terms of health care and health insurance, uh, making sure if you have, you know, kids in college or in high school or whatever it is, you can you know, afford to support them. Um, you know, these are important considerations. And then once you've come, worked through all of that, um, you know, thinking, I think framing is very important and, and making sure that when you're talking about why you are leaving, you are doing so in a way that, um, you know, builds understanding rather than is just, you know, lashing out uh, and, you know, reaching out to different, being able to reach out to different communities and to engage with them, I think is a, a really important part of, so communicating is a, a really important part of it. Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, Josh Paul, thank you so much for joining us, joining us here at WKNC. Thank you very much indeed for having me. Really appreciate it. Absolutely.
debt in North Carolina and across the nation is rising, and experts are offering tips to help people make a shift in their finances. The average person in North Carolina has just over $96,000 in debt across student loans, car loans, credit cards, and other types of personal loans. Joe Mecca with North Carolina's Coastal Credit Union says if you haven't already, now is the best time to tackle financial tasks that can help you get rid of debt and strive for financial security setting goals, doing some planning, and creating or maintaining their budget. They're getting ready to maybe purchase a home and need help with the home buying process, or they're trying to plan for retirement or saving for education. And then a growing trend that we're hearing more and more about is financial caregiving. He says getting these tasks done and thinking about your financial obligations at the beginning of the year are key to think about when building your financial plan. He says starting with the basics and increasing your knowledge along the way are things that can help. He also also says seeking out a professional who can guide the process is also a good place to start. A recent study from WalletHub finds North Carolina was among 18 states that saw an increase in personal debt last year. To bring your financial situation under control, Mecca says it's important to spend less than you earn. He says that means having a clear understanding of your income and expenses and always prioritizing living within your means. He says automation is one way to do this. One thing I always recommend to people is automate as much as you can when you get your payroll deposited into your account. Immediately do a transfer into savings if you're trying to reach a goal or make a transfer into a loan that you're trying to pay down. Transfer into a retirement account. He says checking with your financial institution can be a good resource. For instance, he says Coastal Credit Union has a self-help hub that offers interactive modules covering topics from basic financial planning and budgeting to advanced subjects such as home ownership, investing, and retirement. For North Carolina News Service, I'm Shintia Hudson. Find our trust indicators at publicnewsservice.org. This has been Eye on the Triangle. I'm Erie Mitchell, your guest host right now. Thank you so much for listening to this. You can listen to back episodes of Eye on the Triangle at wknc.org slash podcast under Eye on the Triangle or just any of the other podcasts we have on WKNC. Thank you so much.